I don't know if you're supposed to talk about things that you've learned when you're preparing for the sermon, but I learned what a cloche was. Now, some of you may know what a cloche is, but I didn't. Um, a cloche is that covered dome thing, and it's typically made of metal or, or glass, and, it, and it's, it covers your food and, you know, so that you can do the grand reveal and display your, your food there. And so you may have that ready for Thanksgiving you know, so that you can do the grand reveal, and there's your turkey or your ham or your you know, roast or whatever it is. Um, and so that's what a, 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 a cloche is, and I'm sure if you know what's underneath, there's kind of this sense of anticipation of what's to come. You can't wait as the sounds and smells prepare, uh, prepare you for what's going to be just so delicious. Um, I also found out that cloches are used with steaks, but only in very fine uh, uh, settings. And so I haven't seen this, but, but I've read about it. And they add this, this dramatic and visually ap appealing element to the dining experience as you hear the sizzling from underneath the dome. And so when the dish is brought to the table, you can hear the hissing of the food from under the dome cloche. And it's finally lifted, revealing the perfectly presented dish. The, this reveal adds that touch of theater. Now, if you really wanted to mix it up a bit, you could put a variety of sizzling, hissing things under the cloche. <laughs> it could be a steak. It could be a snake. But you won't know until it's too late. So, now that's theater. And unfortunately, that's also sometimes true with the sizzles in our life. Life sizzles spurs anticipation, inspires hopes, and motivates actions. Tonight we're going to be looking at the story of Balaam. And here's a man that is seen following God's commands, but God is angry at him, and for good reason. He may be acting in accordance with God's commands, but his sizzle, what spurs his anticipation, his hopes, his actions, is far from God. This ultimately leads to his physical demise, as well as having him characterized as one of uh, the great enemies of God's people. Another th uh, thing that the story of Balaam gives us is insight into what's going on on the other side of the Jordan. Uh, so the Israelites show up and we know that those in Jericho were aware of the history of Israel because they had been a dominant force even in the wilderness. If we uh, uh, turn to Joshua and uh, 2, Rahab's talking to the spies there and in verse 9 she says... I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the, to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And when we heard it, our hearts melted, and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven and on the earth beneath. So we often focus on what Joshua was, was doing, but tonight we're going to be focusing on what was happening on the other side of the Jordan as the Moabites and others were preparing for the Israelites' inevitable arrival, as you might expect. God was working on both sides of the river to prepare the land for Israel. So we're going to be predominantly in the book of Numbers tonight. Uh, we're going to be uh, starting in chapter 22 and following. The text is not going to be on the screen, so I highly recommend that you turn there on your Bible or device as we go through the story. So Numbers 22, and we'll be starting in verse 1. Then the sons of Israel journeyed and camped in the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan opposite Jericho. Now Balak, the son of Zippor, uh, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. So Mount Moab was in great fear because of the people, for they were numerous. And Moab was in dread of the sons of Israel. Moab said to the elders of Midian, Now this horde will lick up all that is around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of Moab at that time. So... He sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor of Pethor, which is near the river in the land of the sons of the people, to call him, saying, Behold, a people came out of Egypt. Behold, they cover the surface of the land, and they are living opposite me. Now, therefore, please come, curse this people for me, since they are too mighty for me. Perhaps 
I may be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. So let's get a little insight into this invite. The Moabites seemed insufficient in the uh, face of Israel. Uh, so that's why they didn't try to block their way by force of arms until recently they themselves had been subject to the Amorites and had only been free because of Israel's conquering uh, Sion and Og. Also, let's look at the names of the cast of characters that we have. Balaam means devourer. And some linguists add of the peoples. The longer definition may be more accurate. It's also interesting that he is going to connect with Balak, whose name means devastator. Balaam's father, Baor, means burning as a lamp. So it all kind of fits uh, uh, together. If you take this view, as many do, that Balaam was involved in a family business of Susain. Balaam lived in Pethor, which was famous for its Beru, and, and that's a kind of a, a, a priest diviner. And they were sorcerers or magicians, soothsayers and such. That's why some people believe that Balaam may have come from a long line of diviners and that he and his family have made a living for several generations cursing or blessing people. It was their family trade. They passed it down, giving their sons name that went along with it, names like burning and devour. Obviously, their family's reputation had traveled throughout the region. If anyone wanted someone cursed, they would send for a Biru from Balaam's family since they were world-renowned. Uh, they have uh, these Beiru, regardless of you know, uh, who was making their quest, their politics, their religion, they didn't care, would for a price perform their services say their incantations, make their sacrifices to some particular god, and then curse the other party in the name of that god. So, devastator and devourer are joining forces to block Israel's passage into Canaan. So Balak, the king of Moab, is sending for a renowned curser to come and curse Israel. Balak had heard about the things that God had done for Israel in the wilderness, so he needed the very best to go, uh, to go against them, and he gets Balaam. Uh, Balak anticipates this, you know, some kind of altercation. So he hopes he can find a way to be successful. So this spurs him into action of offering substantial wealth to Balaam to curse Israel. So who's Balaam? He was the renowned soothsayer. Uh, this kind of sets him up on his pedestal. He was accustomed to doing things like this for a price. We can tell from the text that he specializes in blessings and cursings. He probably kept an ear to the ground for any kind of unusual things that might uh, pique his interest in terms of the family business. He probably knew all about what was going on with Israel. It was, you know, an international news story. Uh, and so while not an Israelite, Balaam knew about Israel, Israel's God, and what God had done for Israel in the wilderness. So uh, continuing in verse 7. So the elders of Moab, the elders of Midian, departed with the fees for divination in their hand. And they came to Balaam and repeated Balak's word to him. He said to them, spend the night here. I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. And the leaders of Moab stayed with Balaam. And then God came to Balaam and said, who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent word to me. Behold, there is a people who came out of Egypt and they covered the surface of the land. Now come curse them uh, for me. Perhaps I may be able to fight against them and drive them out. God said to Balaam, do not go with them. You shall not curse the people for they are blessed. So Balaam arose in the morning and said to Balak's leaders, Go back to your land, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. The leaders of Moab arose, went to Balak, and said, Balaam refused to come with us. Now, there's no indication that Balaam really expected the Lord to speak to him because I suspect, you know, he kind of played this scenario for whoever uh, uh, came to him. Um, this, is, this may also be, though, why he takes God so seriously. Look at the conversation. Balaam's conversation is kind of akin to saying to God, I've got this really good business opportunity from the king of the Moabites to curse the Israelites. Can you help me out? 
God's uh, response makes it explicitly clear that the Israelites are blessed. They're not to be cursed. We can give Balaam credit for this. He actually does what God told him and he sent them away uh, with their diviner's fee in his, in his hand. And so he made no money on this. However, and, and this is important, uh, the authors who mention Balaam after this write about him being greedy for profit at Israel's expense. So Balaam's sizzle, if you will, is not an enthusiastic endorsement of God's position. Continuing on in verse 15. Then Balak again sent leaders more numerous, more distinguished than the former. They came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I beg you, hinder you from coming to me. For I will indeed honor you richly, and I will do whatever you say to, uh, to me. Please come then and curse this people for me. And Balaam replied, replied to the servants of Balak, Though Balak was to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not do anything, either small or great, contrary to the command of the Lord my God. Now please, you also stay here tonight, and I'll find out what else the Lord will speak to me. God came to Balaam at that night and said to him, if, if the men have come to call on you, rise up and go with them. But only the word which I speak to you shall you do. So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, went with the leaders of Moab. But God was angry because he was going. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in his way as an adversary against him. Now he was riding on his donkey and his two servants were with him. Balaam should have told the men to turn around. But Balaam again goes to God and says, are you, are you sure? Um, and, and so then God says, okay, you can, you can, you can go with them if they, if they come to you. And, and Balaam's probably thinking, great, God's given me permission. Opportunities await. Balaam anticipates more money from Balak. He hopes he can make some kind of deal. And not hearing God told him not to go considers an endorsement. And so he goes with Balak with his servants. Um, how Balaam replies uh, to the embassy of, of Balak is one of the main themes of the whole account. In verse 18, he says, I cannot go beyond the word, my God, uh, to do less or more. And then in verse 20, he says, God tells him quite specifically, only the word which I speak to you, that you shall do. If God was truly Balaam's God, he would know that Israel was God's elect people. And he wouldn't be asking if he could curse them and absolutely not a second time and he certainly wouldn't be falling in with Balak's servant so why is God angry with Balaam perhaps one of the giveaways is the if statement if the men call on you then you may go the Bible however gives no indication that the men came to call on him again the second day it only says that Balaam woke up saddled his donkey and went with the princes of Moab and so Regardless, where Balaam's heart is, is where his sizzle is. And this puts him at odds with God. If you ask if Balaam's sizzle was steak or steak, it's certainly snake. And that is the problem with sizzle, both for us and, and for Balaam, in that we can find allowances in small areas. And maybe under a certain circumstance, we figure out a way to, uh, to do something. And so we take that as an endorsement that God has sanctioned them as far as we want to go with them. So whether the men called on him or not, Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, off he went. Reading on in verse 22. But God was angry because he was going. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. Now he was riding on his donkey and his two servants were with him. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, the donkey turned off from the way and went into the field. But Balaam struck, but Balaam struck the donkey to turn uh, her back into the way. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path of the vineyards with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pressed herself to the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. The angel of the Lord went further and stood in the narrow place where there was no place to turn left or right. Um, and so when the uh, donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. So Balaam was angry and struck the donkey with his stick. And the Lord... Opened the mouth of the donkey 
And she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And then Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have made a mockery of me, if there had been a sword in my hand, I would have killed you by now. And then the donkey says to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden all your life to this day? Have I ever been accustomed to do so to you? And he says, no. First of all, you have to be really, really angry not to notice your donkey is talking to you. <laughs> so it, it would be like me, and for the cat lovers, no cats were harmed in this, in this, this analogy, but it would be like me throwing a cat off the couch three times and the cat finally turns around and says, what have I done that you would throw me off the couch three times? To which in my anger I would say, because you mock me getting on my couch and if I had a gun I would have shot you. To which the cat would reply, have I ever bothered you on the couch or failed to keep your house free from vermin? Which I would have to say, no. So second of all, to be in this kind of conversation, I'd have to be really self-absorbed. I'd have to be self-centered to be th uh, uh, thinking more of how can I win this argument than the fact that I'm talking to a, a talking cat. And so that's exactly where Balaam finds himself. He is blind to actually what's going on. And so when, you're, when your sizzle is in a bad place, there may be obvious clues that it's not what you anticipated or you hoped for, but you just can't see them. Balaam's donkey is trying to keep him from being, from being drawn into Balaam's demise. The first attempt fails. Balaam is totally oblivious to what is going on. So God narrows him in or hedges him in between two hedges or walls. He's being crushed. And finally, the donkey determines that there's no place to go. So she just stops. We see a similar uh, circumstance with David and Bathsheba. When, he, when David anticipates a positive experience with Bathsheba, he hopes for an ongoing romance. And there are multiple places where if he had not been consumed with his own sizzle, he may have seen his heart was in the wrong place. First, when he inquires, who is this? One of his men says, this is... Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. But that's not enough to stop him. And then she becomes pregnant. And that's not enough to stop him. And so he kills Uriah. And that's when David steps in and says, Stop! And gives him the crushing news that you deserve death. And your child will die. So we see God. God may do this more frequently than we allow for. First, when we're in a, wide, uh, you know, in a wide place, God allows us to make decisions. It soon becomes apparent we're, uh, we're going in the, if, if we're paying attention, that we're going in the wrong direction. Consequences begin to accumulate. We have time to make the right uh, decision if we just turn around. Paying attention to the ifs here, they are so important. If we pay attention if we turn around perhaps we don't pay attention to the ifs and we go further that's where all we can do is stop and say God help me I've gone the wrong way I need you to show me the path and that's what David did and I've been there perhaps you have too and God will show us the path if we want him to if we ask him to and so this is where Balaam finds himself in these verses. The donkey simply lies down because that's all she can do. In Proverbs 22, in verse 3, it says, a prudent, man, a prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. The prudent pay attentions to the ifs. The donkey is the prudent man and Balin is the simple. He is so self-absorbed on his civil or on his sizzle that he's foolish to the point of injury. He doesn't consider what's going on. He even talked to God and God talked to him telling him the emphasis should be regarding the Israelites. And Balaam seems blind to all of us. We're going to continue in verse 31. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam 
And he saw the angel of the Lord standing in his way with his drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed all the way to the ground. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey three times? Behold, I have come out as an adversary because your way was contrary to me. But the donkey saw me, turned aside from me three times. If she had not turned aside from me, I surely would have killed you just now and let her live. And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know you were standing in the way against me. Now then, if it's displeasing to you, I'll turn back. But the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but you shall speak only the word which I tell you. So Balaam went along with the leaders of Balak. Balaam admits that he's done wrong. But he blames his own blindness. I just, I just didn't see the way that you wanted me to go, God. He's terrified, but he doesn't ask God for mercy. He just says, okay, I'll go back if you want me to. God nevertheless, he uses Balaam for his purpose and to deliver his message and deliver he does. For the first message in front of Balak, Balaam sets up seven altars to sacrifice seven bulls and seven rams. And then he asks God, what would he ask him to, you know, God, what would you have me say? It's almost as if he's trying to influence God's actions, bribing God. Then he does as God commands. He blesses God's people for which Balak is furious because this is not where Balak's sizzle is. So Balak thinks, well, perhaps it's the place. I know you can't do it here, but maybe it would be okay to do it somewhere else. And because this is really Balak's sizzle. He hopes that if he can't get the whole thing, maybe I can just get a, a piece of it. So he requests in chapter 23 that Balaam perhaps could curse just a small piece of them. If you can't engage all of it, maybe just some of it will work. Of course, this has the same results. So Balak takes him to one more place, but Balaam realizes the bribes are not going to work with God. So he delivers a third blessing uh, on God's people, and God adds his curses to the Moabites and their uh, allies. But this is not the entire story. While Balaam cannot influence God to his desire, he teaches Balak that the key to defeating the Israelite people is through their desires. The, word, the Israelites were not unaware of Balaam and his attempts to curse him. In Nehemiah, in Nehemiah 3, it says, On the day they read aloud the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and there was found in the, written in the book that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter into the assembly of God because they did not meet the sons of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, our God turned that curse into blessing. So when they heard the law, they excluded all foreigners from Israel. Furthermore, Balaam's talked about several times in the New Testament in 2 Peter uh, uh, 2 and verse uh, 15. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Baor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he rebuked a rebuke for his own trans uh, but he received a rebuke for his own transgression for a, from a mute donkey speaking with the voice of a man restrain the madness of the prophet. One of the more stinging rebukes in the New Testament comes in Jude, where it uses Cain and Balaam and the sons of Korah to indicate where your heart is, where your sizzle is, should be with the Lord Almighty. If it's not, it shows a lack of understanding and foolishness, even if you're among the Lord's people in uh, Jude and uh, picking up at verse 10. But these men reviled the things which they did not understand and the things which they know by instinct like unreasoning animals by these things they are destroyed. Woe to them for, he have, for they have gone the way of Cain and for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feasts and when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves. Clouds without water, carried along by the winds. Autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted. Wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam. Wandering stars, for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. And it's in Revelation 2 that we find that Balaam, while he could not curse God's people, he talked Balak, how to influence them for ill. 
have their hearts, their sizzles, turn from God, have them hope for and then focus on ungodly things. Revelations 2 and 14. But I have a few things against you because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. So we don't know for sure if Balak rewarded Balaam for this, but we do know that if he did, he didn't enjoy it for long. In Joshua uh, 13 and 21, it says, the sons of Israel also killed Balaam, the son of Baor, the diviner, with a sword among the rest of the slain. You can't match wits with the God of the universe and win. And unfortunately, Israel fell into adultery and fornication, which they paid dearly. And we see the same warning coming to the early churches who desired worldly things in deference to what is holy. As place, this is places where God says in Revelations to reconsider, turn around, stop what you're doing. This brings Balaam and his doctrine, his error, his sin, his rebellion, right down to our time. It's something that we should think about. We should be wary of. So, the question that we have to ask for all of us, and, 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 and this is myself included, what fills us with anticipation? What inspires our hopes? What motivates our actions? This is important because we see that Balak considered Balaam God's emissary. While the, the king may have considered him a holy person, his sizzle, his desires, his heart were clearly in the wrong place. What was under his cloche may have been sizzling, but it was certainly more snake than steak. Now let me be real clear. This doesn't mean we can't have pursuits. We can't have hobbies. We can't have enjoyments. We can't go after things. But it does mean we have to be careful about how much they're influencing our hearts, our hopes, and our actions. C.S. Lewis cautions us against this uh, very thing in the screw tape letters, uh, uh, letters. He says, pleasure in itself, harmless, may become harmful because it is ple it's not the pleasure, but it's because it leads to greedy, greedily increasing the dose. Many of us, I like to think, most of us, at Oldham have been around long enough to know that we need to be holy. We need to be spiritual. The church is not a nicety, it's a necessity because we have got to get here because it's where our sizzle is. That's where our heart is. So if you find yourself on occasion uh, saying, well, being spiritual is a chore. It's getting in the way what I'd really like to be doing. Then you have to ask yourself, where is your sizzle? Jesus is pretty clear about having your sizzle, your heart on earthly things. Matthew 6 and 16, do not st uh, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. There are three takeaways for tonight. The first, and this is the most important, where your treasure is, what you hope for, where your heart is, makes a difference. The second, allowances are not the same as endorsements. Just because I can do something doesn't mean I should do something. And third, when we see that we're going the wrong way, when our heart is in the wrong place, ask God to show you the path. He will. The fact that we may have difficulties in life may be God giving us some clues that we need to tur turn around because our heart is not in the right place. Perhaps things are squishing us in and it may be a clue, just like it was for Balaam, that we need to stop because we're going in the wrong direction and our hearts not in the right place. As Blake suggested this morning, this may not be God trying to harm us, but rather God trying to change us so that we're going the right way. 
his way. In Romans 12, it says that we're being, that we should be transformed with a new heart, that we may be able to discern the will of God, hear his voice, attend to his ways. It's a constant pursuit, and I'm so happy to be here because, well, God is my sizzle. And I'm so happy to be here because you're here. And for most of you, God is your sizzle. And it's a pleasure to be in a place like this. It's an oasis of peace where the world is not turned upside down and love and joy abound. So perhaps there's someone here that does not have this. And you can, you can in Jesus Christ by pledging to him in the waters of baptism or perhaps you're going in the wrong direction and you need to turn around that your sizzle has been misplaced and that you need to recalibrate the direction that you're going you can do that too God is patient he wants you to be going in the right direction because he loves you if you have any need won't you come forward as we sing the song that's been selected.